Welcome to Season 2 of Triple Overtime. In this first exciting episode, the boys come back with a bang, discussing the life and times of the legendary John Madden. Also, what's wrong with the Los Angeles Lakers? Plus, the guys catch up since the end of Season 1 and give their favorite sports moments of 2021. Get some Gatorade and buckle that chin strap because this is Triple Overtime. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, everyone. Maybe for the first time, maybe you're coming back. This is season two of Triple Overtime. We are back and better than ever. Well, hopefully at least as good as last time you saw us. Maybe this is the first time, like I said, in which case, thank you for jumping in. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you stay well because we have some juicy sports talk tonight. Austin Snyder, Amar Burton, my two bros here, my two sports talk homies, if you will. How are you guys doing tonight? We'll Amar, go what's going on? Um, I'm doing good, man. I mean, it's been it's been so long since what I guess we're gonna call that the end of season one. Um, I feel like a whole bunch of stuff happened in sports that we missed, and a few things are the same. I mean, you know, Tom Brady's still pretty good, LeBron James is still pretty good. Um, so you know, not 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 everything's changed, but yeah, it's been a lot. It's like record. You know, time I like that a bar LeBron in there. Mm-hmm. Right. I like that. Uh, Amar and Dylan both. Dylan especially, you know, what better way to, uh, 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 I guess, come or make up for all that time that we've missed, you know, other than just saying it was the end of season one, right? Now we're back into season two. <laughs> but things are great, man. I mean, we had a super amazing Christmas. Uh, we got peppered uh, with some snow here not too long ago. So we're definitely in the middle of winter. Um, but yeah, I mean, life has just been amazing. I'm incredibly excited to get in and talk some sports with you guys. Uh, there's been some very major things happening. Um, so yeah, I'm just stoked for it, man. Can't, can't wait to get into it here. Yeah. I'm just going to say, I missed you guys. I miss jumping on the mic here. I miss jumping on the zoom, uh, sound issues, notwithstanding everybody knows we use zoom. It's not the greatest technology, but it's what we got. And what we got is each other also. And we got sports talk. And you can't beat that, right, guys? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely not. Yeah. And, you know, Dylan, now you've got all that camera experience. It's uh, now you're just always ready. You're always, like, in game mode, right? Yeah. It's just uh, too bad. Uh, yeah. Uh, something like that. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> let's jump right into it. Uh, we did have some uh, some sad news recently, you know. Uh, it, when, whenever you're watching this, I don't know how many days it'll have been, but just recently, uh, last night, uh, we heard about the passing of the late, great John Madden, a true legend, not just in football, not just in the NFL, but this guy transcended sports. I mean, he was a huge, larger than life personality, and he meant a lot to a lot of people. And what we're going to do here is just kind of talk about what he meant to us and uh, maybe when we first saw him and uh, what we think of his legacy and uh and so on and so forth. So, Amar, uh, since Austin just cut out, his video is already messing up. It's uh, five minutes. Into <laughs> no, I'm good. Season two. We're going to start with you, Amar. <laughs> Talk about <laughs> that in a little bit. Um, you know, like I'm, you know, down here in Las Vegas, you know, home of the Raiders. And so I think the, the Madden news is really big, you know, down here. Um, and I'm looking at it kind of just from a more the the coach Madden perspective than the announcer Madden or the video game figure Madden perspective. Um, it was kind of, it's kind of crazy. Like you look at Madden's coaching career and he didn't coach for like 25 years or win, you know, five Super Bowls or anything like that. It's like he coached for, I think about, it was like 10 years maybe with one team, yeah. one, one, one Super Bowl. And so it's like, it's not like, the greatest resume of all time, but he still stands in history as like one of the best coaches ever. His win percentage was so high. I think it was like 73%, you know, I think he still uh, holds the record for the highest win percentage. Right. Yeah. Second highest. Yeah. Like just like so much success kind of in this, in coaching terms, like this condensed, you know, period of time, Um, you know, almost like if you were to compare it to a player, like, you know, somebody who came in and was just like, 
really successful for a short time and then you know injury or something you know ended their career um kind of like honestly like, it reminds me a lot of uh jim brown you know jim brown or almost barry sanders like yeah um, and just kind of walked away at the top of his game right yeah he jim brown was yeah. in the league for 10 years nine of the 10 seasons i could be wrong maybe it was eight but i'm almost positive nine of the 10 seasons that jim brown was in the nfl he led the league in rushing he just right. like it, you know compared to a lot of other historical hall of fame legendary figures 10 years just isn't a lot you know what i mean especially yeah. when you're considering this day and age where you know these hall of fame type players are playing 15 20 you know in tom brady's play case mm. maybe even 25 30 years <laughs> you know i know yeah. that sounds ridiculous but um yeah. you know but you're right the impact was just so great in that amount of time that it's just the legend lives on forever you mm. know yeah and yeah you know I'm, like most people you know around our age group you know we kind of came to know Madden mo you know, more for the video games or maybe you were introduced to him like as an announcer but and his coaching career was you know before my time but I was just going and looking back at you know the numbers and stuff and like the impact he had just as a coach and it's just like really incredible and kind of doesn't get enough credit and yeah, correct think, me if I'm wrong but I think if I remember right so John, I know John Madden it's second all-time highest career win percentage I'd have to look up first I thought I just it was remember hard. hearing it I thought it was. Uh, I remember hearing games. it on Fox Sports News Radio uh, yesterday when it happened that it was second all time. Mm. Uh, is that minimum 100 games though, or is that just like a period? That uh, maybe just period. Again, I could be wrong. What I do know though is that in his 10 years, he never lost, or he never, yeah, he never lost more. He always had at least 10 wins. I guess is what I'm getting at. So, which is pretty incredible. You know, we see a lot of these coaches in this state. Pete Carroll's kind of a perfect example, um, as you see the big Seahawks banner there. But, uh, but especially being that there's so much, like, call for his job this season, right, and, and a lot of talk that he'll be leaving. But we look mm -hmm. at his resume since he's came to the Seahawks, and, you know, it's so incredible, uh, all the playoff appearances, all that kind of stuff that he's done in his tenure here. Now you take that, apply it to John Madden back when he played in an incredibly tough era of football with a lot of very, very good players and historical teams. And for him to, to uh, uh, always win 10 plus games, win a Super Bowl and create such a huge impact. I mean, like you said, Amar, you know, for me being 31 years old, uh, the video games, the announcing, uh, that was more of how I knew John Madden. Um, but as Dylan can attest to, we spent a lot of time uh, watching NFL Network when it first came out. It was nothing but old school NFL films and just the history mm. of the league. So we really got to know, you know, the, the story and legend of John Madden and what kind of coach he was. And, and he's just such an inspirational guy. Uh, when Dylan and I had initially text about John Madden's passing, um, I, I had said it and I stand by it. personally I think he's the most influential figure in NFL history you know when you account for what he was able to do coaching wise when you account for how big and 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 famous he got and celebrity he got just from announcing and then having his name attached to the Madden video game that mm -hmm. is that's the standard we've even had NFL players including guys like M MVP uh, uh, Cam Newton come out and say that they literally play that game at, almost as practice to like get a better understanding. Granted, it's not, you know, real deal football, but I mean, for guys to, to grow up attached with that name there, it's synonymous with football, you mm -hmm. know? So it's just really, really incredible how he has transcended the sport so much while never doing really anything outside of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, he probably, you know, introduced a ton of new people to the game, you know, either as kids or, you know, getting, them getting into the video game. And I mean, you can't like sit in a room of people and watch football for a Sunday and Madden's name's going to come up because someone's going to make some reference to the game or, you know, oh, I, I would have ran that play on Madden or whatever. So it's just like, yeah, like you said, it's like his influence is there. He's just kind of like, you know, this figure over the game that, yeah, you know, coaching, announcing, video game, like his name's just kind of everywhere. So I just looked it up. Uh, number one on the win percentage, it is less than 100 games. So I think that's why they say Madden, minimum 100 games, highest win percentage. Right. 
Guy Chamberlain, and I'm sure you all know that name. You didn't play the oh, Guy Chamberlain yeah. video games? Six oh, seasons damn, from bro, you don't know who Guy Chamberlain six, is? Yeah. Come on, six man. seasons from 1922 to 1927. <laughs> he went yep. undefeated in his first two seasons with the Canton Bulldogs. So good, yeah, like good old Canton the team Bulldogs. that's not even existence anymore. <laughs> So yeah. we're gonna go and say John Madden's got the highest win percentage minimum on game. Oh game. man, look, look, Cham- <laughs> Cham- look, Chamberlain '87 on the Atari. That was my game. Like, that was... Put some respect on Chamberlain's name, bro. You know, uh, another you know, thing about John right. Madden that I think uh, a lot of, especially younger football fans, don't think about is that like the fun color commentator that we all love now, like the Tony Romo or whomever it is. Like John Madden was the first one to really be that guy. You know, he was the first, like, kind of every man, simple, like, call out a play, tell you what happened here, you know, break it down in, like, layman's terms, so you'd know, and he was fun, and he had his own terminology, his own catchphrases, he had the boom, you know, and then you knock over right. the mic just like that, you have a <laughs> boom, like, John Madden, like, brought all that to life, he was really the first commentator that was like that in, maybe not just football, but maybe just in sports, you know what I mean, and he, that's how he helped transcend, uh, the game of football because he was a he was already a hall of fame coach but once he got that broadcast job like the guy was everywhere he was on miller light commercials he was on the video game he was endorsing tough acton to acton he, he was, was on little you know, things at he walmart yeah he was an actor mm-hmm. like this guy was everywhere if you didn't grow up in the 90s you probably don't realize how how just influential john madden is not just in sports but like the whole sports media universe basically like he is one of the well, most recognizable figures of all time when it comes to not just the NFL, but sports in general. You're right, Dylan. And I mean, the way that the things are like these sports, these professional sports are broadcast, broken down, analyzed, et cetera, in real time during the games nowadays is a direct result of John Madden because nobody was doing that. Nobody, you, you had your, your basic play-by-play announcer and then your commentator who, who you know, your color uh, commentator who is going to go into some of the stats, some of the history, et cetera, et cetera. But you never had someone that was going to take the time and that could so seamlessly from, from a fourth down punt, right? all the way going into the next drive could take in a matter of seconds, an entire play sequence or drive, break it down so that the average man or woman can understand exactly what happened, what to look for, you know, on the next drive, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody was doing that. And now that's the entire premise of every sports show of every, every uh, uh, analyst, every, everything, you know, it's breaking it down showing the people how how things went the way that they did, what this play mm-hmm. meant, you know, what to look for, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's incredible that here we are in 2021 and all they, they've taken his same basic formula and then just uh, uh, you know, maybe made it better just through, you know, advancement in technology, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's still just the same basic format that John Madden was using all those years ago. You think the the NFL pregame show with like eight guys in the studio, they're trying to recreate that. We're just sitting on the couch, a bunch of guys talking football. And that was kind of like what you said, John Madden kind of introduced. And right. now it's the standard. And, you know, some people don't do it as well as others, but that's what they're all shooting for. It's what they're all gunning for is like that right. kind of that Madden, you know, that Madden effect. Yeah, a lot well, of people and I'll talk tell about you, how great – a lot of people talk about how great Tony Romo is as a color commentator, you know, like, I feel like these people didn't know that Madden had been doing, Madden had been doing this for a while. You know what I mean? Mm. Like not saying Romo is not great at his job, but Madden like pretty much invented it. You know what I mean? Like the whole breakdown, nobody was showing you why a guy got open on a play before it was just, you know, he throws the ball right. and touchdown. Like it, it, have you guys watched some of those old games with like old commentary? Some of it is mm. very warm. vanilla. So we were super oh, yeah. dry, you know, Bradshaw drops back, he throws it and touchdown, you know, that's so like right. really bad Super Nintendo no commentary or something like that. Yeah, yeah, no, no breakdown, no understand, you know, it's nice. And John Madden, again, was one of the first guys that you felt like you weren't just watching some professional celebrity or whatever on TV telling you what's happening in the game. It's almost like you're, you're sitting there with your buddy 
talking about the game, right? Like you're, you're going over and discussing the game. Why, you know, the same basic conversations that we would all have if we're sitting in the bar, having a beer, watching the football game. I mean, it's just the same basic things, right? So now with that being said, one of my favorite parts about John Madden, obviously as a gamer was the Madden football game. And now one of the best things that made Madden what it was, wasn't just the gameplay or anything else like that, but it was his commentary on the game as well. So I was going to do a list of five, but I'll just rattle off a couple. But some of my favorite moments from those video games were the simplistic commentary that he would have on it that made you kind of scratch your head, but you loved it anyways. Um, One of them being, well, that guy really knows how to use his arms and legs. (laughs) Um, the other one is well when he throws it in the air and the wide receiver catches it in the end zone that's a touchdown and uh, one of my all-time go ahead I wonder if like because when when you do that it's not like he went in and just I doubt he went in just ad-libbed I wonder if they wrote him this generic script and he just read it off because what the way that works is you come in you do the voiceovers and you get paid and you leave you know man's not programming the game so i wonder if they're just like i just give this guy some football lines and that'll be good uh that you know that may very well be the case and it would uh, account for some of that if big if some of this stuff wasn't things that he said live you know i mean there's a uh, one of them being if this team doesn't put points on the board i don't see how they can win so and that (laughs) was a a live commentary right so but that again Again, though, and, and I don't, I say that just out of jest, it, it's, you know, totally lightheartedness uh, for what the, le- the legend that he was, but that in itself just explains, you know, how, how his mind works of just trying to break every facet of the game down to its simplest form. So whether you are an 80 year old person who's watched the game their entire life and understands all the ins and outs of the intricacies of the preparation, the game plan, the play calling, the defensive schemes, the offensive schemes, et cetera. Or if you're someone who maybe you just watch on Thursday or on Thanksgiving, uh, uh, catch the Thursday game once a year with your family, at least then you can really, really comprehend and understand exactly what's going on and exactly the kind of mindset that these players have or why they do the things that they do. Man, I feel like I'm going to be eight years old by the time Austin finishes point there. (laughs) <laughs> uh, we are right back in the swing of things with long-winded Austin Snyder. Uh, let's move on uh, uh, to, a, to a little uh, modern-day uh, NBA basketball here. Uh, Amar, let's talk about, because media does not talk about this team enough, obviously, or this player, LeBron James. Let's talk about the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, I find this team incredibly interesting because I didn't necessarily think that Westbrook was going to be this magical piece and they just ride to a title. But I definitely didn't think that they'd be this mediocre. I know injuries are playing a factor, but injuries play a factor for every team, right? They play Mm. factor for every team in every sport every year. Amar, you are uh, probably the the bigger LeBron fan out of all three of us and the bigger Lakers fan out of all three of us. Uh, What is wrong with this team right now? Like, why are they so, they're not terrible, but they're just so Mm. incredibly average. Just yeah. average. <laughs> um, it's hard to like pinpoint what's wrong. Um, they, I mean, <clears throat> defense, you know, defense is an issue. You know, defensive breakdowns, injuries is obviously an issue. Um, the whole like you know age thing going into the season, the big knock on them was age, and I haven't necessarily seen like age being the problem because the guy who's been out of the lineup the most. Anthony Davis is the youngest one of their stars. Like he's the only one still in his twenties, you know? Um, So it's just, I mean, you know, there's, there's a chemistry element, you know, you bring in all these new pieces at once and they, they need time to work together, develop a chemistry and a rhythm and all that. Um, When, you know, you're dealing with other teams that have been together for a little bit and, and, you know, they're, they're going to have a leg up on that sense, but um, you know, LA did this in the 20, 2019 2020 season they brought in a bunch of new guys that was the year they brought in Anthony Davis and they got together and they won the championship so you know that may not be a good excuse um 
I don't well, keep in mind there was a lot of chatter around that initial move when they first started. They didn't get off to some ridiculous, you know, 19 game win streak or whatever mm. right out of the gate. And there was a lot of talk that like, well, was that the right move for Anthony Davis? Was that right. the correct move for the Lakers? Was you know, yeah. is that is can LeBron James and Anthony Davis coexist despite the fact that there was nothing out there that would point to the fact that like that relationship was strained out of the gate, you mm. know. Yeah. And, you know, and Westbrook, you know, he he'll get his triple doubles and he'll have like kind of his his bulk numbers here and there. But he's not playing like the Russell Westbrook that we've seen, you know, the last few years, you know, in other stops. He's turned the ball over a lot. He's just, you know, like the the low light clips people are putting together like he just doesn't look like himself i don't know if it's the pressure of playing for the hometown team or you know pressure of being on this contender everyone's expecting him to do so much um you know not according to him remember remember he said like Mm -hmm. it'd be cool if i won a championship but if i don't oh well you know i'm paraphrasing obviously but he was just kind of like whatever bro yeah he was like if we win cool if not you know it doesn't sound like there's at least according to that quote doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of pressure on him they're just not playing well and the thing that's really so, shocking about this team is they get mm-hmm. blown out by really bad basketball teams. They don't just yeah. lose to bad basketball teams. They get hammered by bad basketball And teams. they don't blow anyone out either. Even like the games that they – it seems like all their games are either the game's close or they get blown out. It's like they – I can't recall like – and being down here, you know, in, in Vegas, like we actually get this channel where I get like all the Lakers games pretty much. And, yeah, like I can't recall – you know, maybe one or two times this year where they've just blown somebody out. It's always like a nail biter or they go into the fourth and they're still maybe in it and then they just get blown out for them. Like, I don't know what's going on. Um, I do feel like, though, this is going to be a trade deadline, blow it up, you know, some big trades at the trade deadline to kind of retool. This this team reminds me a lot of the uh, 2018 Cavaliers when I was just going to say the same thing they have, it was LeBron, Kevin Love, and Dwayne Wade, Derek Rose. Um, I think that was Isaiah Thomas was there. You know, they had these big names midway through the season. It was not working. I think they were hovering around 500, just like the Lakers are now. And they, you know, traded away way. They got rid of Thomas. Like I feel like they're going to do the Lakers are going to do that same thing. And I don't blame them. You know, I know people like the whole, you know, organic, you know, build your team and let them develop and all that. When your best player is over 35 and your second best player is, I like using the term injury prone because I'm like, it's everyone's prone to injury. And Anthony Davis, Lamar, he's no, 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 this is, this is why I like the term. <laughs> Anthony Davis has played thousands of basketball games in his life right. and he's been injured like what 10 times 20, whatever the number is it's a very small percentage compared That's to how much check, you remember no, wait. 82 percent of his games you mm. remember you remember what charles barkley called him right what anthony street, anthony street oh, street, oh, street clothes, clothes. Yeah, he's always in his street clothes yeah. he's always <laughs> well That's like, i'm just saying i'd be personally like i don't like that, using though. the term injury prone so i'll just say your best player is over 35. Your second best player falls down a lot. Let's say <laughs> that. <laughs> um, you, don't, you don't have time to, like, let it develop. You know, you Lakers right. are – they're in a win-now mode. We don't know yeah. how big this window is. You're not talking about right. year two, year three LeBron and a rookie. Right. This. Yeah, this isn't like right. a, you know, let's keep this core together. And, you know, but like, see, it's, it's constant win-now mode. And so that's why I think the right thing to do is just – they got to just make some moves. and That's you know. my biggest problem with the criticism of the Lakers, though, is it's so centered around the, around the Westbrook trade. And, excuse me, don't get me wrong. I agree. It just doesn't – it's not working. I, I hmm. personally thought it would have been a really good move just to allow LeBron James to kind of load manage a little bit more this season and put himself hmm. in a position to be fresh and healthy and everything else going into the postseason. Um, but it's just not working. You know, hmm. I, I think – we're seeing a lot of the same issues that we saw with a young Westbrook back when he was, uh, you know, in his very young, early big three days with Harden and Durant, where he just, it, 
I hate saying it because I actually really like Westbrook, but I just don't think he plays well with other stars. I just don't. I think that he's at his best when he's the focal point. He's the one that can dominate the mm. ball and he's the one that can run the offense. And that's just not that never could be, never would be, never was going to be the case in LA. So I'm sure conversations were had where he'd be given his time to shine. But at the end of the day, he mm. needs to be a square piece and a square peg to fit in that puzzle to allow it to, to work properly. But aside yeah, think- from all of that, right? Like you're right. I think by the trade deadline, Westbrook, whoever else they thought might've worked, none included, et cetera, they're going to go, they're going to kind of retool halfway through the season and make a, a deep playoff run. I think the biggest problem though, is there's not enough, there's not enough criticism around the Anthony Davis issue. Cause even mm-hmm. when he was healthy, he was not playing his best basketball this season. You know, he was playing very timid. He was, uh, you know, there was a few games where he was, what, like two for 15 and 0 for 6 from 3 and just really not putting it together. So I don't know what may have occurred if maybe the addition of Westbrook uh, just kind of got him out of his comfort zone so much that he couldn't make it work. But, you know, Anthony Davis is supposed to be the guy that, this team is going to be centered around if, and you know, not if, when LeBron James finally steps back, not only out of the limelight of being the face of the franchise, but, you know, eventually retires, you know, that's always been the goal or talk or understanding around bringing Davis into LA is that he's the future. And if that guy's your future, you might as well just call him the, the Pelicans 2.0, because at this point he's not carrying anybody anywhere. You know, he's just not playing super duper great dominant basketball that a guy that's been touted as a top five player in the league should be playing. Hmm. I I wonder if the the right person, the right fit here, and I don't know how, you know, this they make this move happen, but I've been saying Ben Simmons might be the one for them. I agree. Might be the fit. He's the, the playmaker. I mean, he's as much as Westbrook tries to do too much. Simmons is, you know, thing is that he doesn't try to do enough. Right. As and a I school. think that's where but as a where playmaker really defender. Yeah. Well, he his defense addresses one of their maybe their biggest weakness. He's yep. a playmaker, passer. He allows LeBron and Davis to be scorers. Him and LeBron already yep. have a relationship. LeBron's like a mentor type to him. So now he hasn't played all season. And so then there's like the rust factor and all that. But if he's keeping himself in shape, then I don't know. You know, it might it might be one of these like three three team four team deals but i could see the lakers working behind the scenes right now to like do whatever they can to get ben simmons or maybe damian lillard and get westbrook out of it yeah you probably I think probably, that'd be probably a got a fit. probably probably got lebron putting on his gm hat right now guys trying to make <laughs> it right so uh hey, we are, power we are him. he's built championship teams before we are we are coming up against it but real quick uh let's all let's all give uh, our favorite sports moment of 2000 21 because by the time this airs it probably will be uh past new year's eve obviously into the new year so omar real fast what was your favorite sports moment of uh, 2021 real quick mm, okay i know we don't have a lot of time but I, I had a tie i had to pick two moments i couldn't i couldn't break the tie one That's global already cheating this, this, this <laughs> already cheating. Yeah. what one global one personal globally uh, my favorite moment was the return of the olympics um i'm a big Olympics fan. Um, the one, the biggest downer of an event that got canceled in 2020 because of the pandemic, other than my baby shower, was the 2020 Olympics getting canceled. That was like the one where I was just like, man, like, I couldn't believe that. So to have it come back in uh, 2021, um, you know, me to, to get that Olympic fix, that was my favorite moment, you know, from the track to weightlifting, to basketball, to swimming and diving and just all the all, all the sports like that's my thing um personal favorite sports moment 2021 was happened in my gym when i punched my heavy bag off of the stand all right austin <laughs> that, real quick. it was yeah, just a just a pure seconds. pure power moment when my muay thai in the garage and i just delivered that right hand and the thing it just came down you know i didn't know i had that punching power in me so yeah, that, that's that. That's my most memorable moment. Something I always cherish. Austin, real quick, we got like thirty seconds. Go. All right, uh, Jake Paul knocking out Tyrone Woodley this last time just shows that he actually is taking the sport serious, working real hard, putting in the effort, grinding in the gym. Good for you, buddy. You finally got my respect. 
All right, mine's Steph Curry becoming the all-time leader in three-point shots. Greatest shooter of all time. It was awesome to see. And it was we're all at a time. We'll see you next time on Triple Overtime. <laughs>